Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Atlantic Circle in Conversation talk. Today's talk's title is In Search of Supersized Swarms and Why Krill Are Important to Us All. My name is Magda Joshi. I'm the Events and Alumni Engagement Manager at the college, and I'm delighted to be uh, today's uh, host. Um, firstly, a few housekeeping matters. Um, if you could please rename yourselves on, um, on the screen so we can know your name as well as affiliation to the college. Uh, secondly, uh, please uh, keep yourself on mute throughout the event uh, uh, um, until the Q&A session if uh, you would like to um, ask a question to our speaker directly, then um, you will be welcome to unmute yourself. Uh, in terms of your questions for um, our speaker, uh, please uh, post them throughout his presentation on uh, our chat on Zoom. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll have a Q&A session in the second half of today's event. So you will be able to ask your question um, directly. Uh, today's speaker, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Geraint Tar Tarling, who uh, is a biological ocean oceanographer with over 25 years of experience. Uh, currently, uh, Geraint uh, heads the Ocean Ecosystems Group at the British Antarctic Survey, and I'm sure he will uh, tell us more about it in just a moment. Um, uh, Geraint's uh, research uh, uh, focuses on um, uh, the um, or, uh, marine organisms of uh, small scale and how uh, these uh, swarms can have major impacts on large scale uh, processes. Uh, without further ado, I am delighted to hand over to Geraint. Hello, I hope you can hear me. Thank you for all um, attending. This is a first for me and seeing some uh, faces I recognize from uh, my time at Atlantic College is uh, is great actually. So uh, thank you for coming. I hope I can uh, keep your interest uh, for the, the rest of the talk. Um, I'm going to be talking about my work. I'll also be talking about the work of some other UWC alumni that are working in the same field as me. So it's interesting to see, you know, how some people converge in their careers and how we've got on uh, with what we're trying to do. Um, and yeah, I'll be very happy to take questions. You know, my talk um, is trying to make uh, things um, explicable you know it, there are some slides that I've taken some from academic talks but um, a lot of them are hopefully are, are illustrative of, of the concepts I'm trying to get across. But I'm going to start my talk by actually talking about my my own uh, career to this point uh, which I think is what um, hopefully people also want to hear so I'll try and share my screen. Um, hang on. Uh, share screen okay here we go. I need to start at the beginning here. That isn't the beginning, sorry. So I'm gonna scroll through these really quickly. Should have heard this earlier, sorry. Right, okay, there, okay. That's a krill, okay. Um, I don't know whether you can see my screen. I'm holding up a krill just to give you a sense of scale. That's a krill, uh, if you can see in plexiglass there to try and stop it from, from rotting. So that's the sort of size of organism that we're talking about. So actually, People think krill are tiny, minute organisms. They're not. They actually are the size of, of shrimp, but they're incredibly abundant. Uh, and I'm going to go through the reasons uh, why they are, how we know they're so abundant, uh, and actually what that means for a lot of things in terms of the food webs, but also about global climate as well. As you can see, I'm based at the British Antarctic Survey, and I've been here for about 20, 20 years now, actually, quite a while. But there's me. That's me as a 16-year-old. I'm the third from the left on the back row. You can see I haven't changed that much in all that time. I see I can't hear the laughter now, but there we are. I'll, I'll leave that to, for the silence. But um, that's a cohort there of the first years. But I want you to notice the house that we are in, because that's quite relevant for a bit later on. We're in Belcher House. So I was there between 1986 and 1988. And I'm still in touch with quite a lot of those people, which just shows what an influence UWC has on the rest of your life. And this being my career. So when I was actually at Atlantic College, I did an IB in biology, chemistry and maths higher. 
And my extended essay then was on salinity tolerance in estuarine seaweeds. So I went to the Ogmore Estuary and I did a transect along there. And that really set me up for a career in marine biology. I love doing that extended essay. It really sort of taught me a lot about the things I really love doing. And from that, I really wanted to do zoology or biology. I chose zoology in the end as an undergraduate degree, which I did in Oxford. Um, I needed to, when I was there, I felt as if I really wanted to bring in physics and chemistry into the things that I'm doing scientifically as well. And oceanography is a really good path for that because you have to bring in all those elements when you're studying the science of oceanography. And I was lucky enough to get a PhD looking at the biological oceanography, so more the biological elements in the South Atlantic. And that was done at Southampton University. And then, you know, that's quite a sort of a, a launch pad about what you're going to do next after you've done a PhD, whether you are going to pursue a career in research or not. I was lucky enough to get an opening uh, in the Scottish Association for Marine Science. Uh, and the position I was uh, given there was to look at the physiology and behavior of zooplankton, which followed on to some extent from what I was doing for a PhD. I did manage to get a fellowship to keep going there as well beyond my postdoc until I was snapped up by the British Antarctic Survey to come into their ecosystems team and look at euphorses to look at krill. And that's where I've been ever since. So my talk, I'm going to sort of try and make it as, as logical as possible. I'm going to start off with actually describing to you what krill are. You've seen a little image of them. I'm going to talk more about their biology as well. Actually, who wants krill? Um, why are they relevant at all to us? Um, how many there are? I mean, actually, this is quite a big question. Trying to estimate their biomass is quite a major scientific area of research. I'm just going to sort of brush over that, but give you some insight into some of the difficulties we have in trying to estimate their biomass. And why do they matter? So this is going to bring me on to actually some of the bigger themes of this talk about their role in climate in particular. And they're actually, a, they are a massive biomass, but actually their, their future is under threat as well. So I'm going to talk about the future of krill. So firstly, what are krill? So this might be where you come across krill, possibly, uh, you know, with your children or grandchildren uh, looking at happy feet. This is an image of a krill as far as Disney is concerned. And actually, they didn't do such a bad job. Actually, they've got the, the coloration of the cuticle quite good, so the chromatophores on there. They've actually got the antennae quite good. And if you can see some of those furry bits underneath its mouth, that's its feeding basket. But what they don't have is camera-like eyes like us. Actually, they have... Um, compound eyes, more like insects. So Warner Brothers did an okay job, but they didn't really sort of get the cigar. This is a, a picture, an academic picture of a krill on the left hand side there at 65 millimeters long. And uh, the name itself actually comes, it's a Norwegian word actually for whale food. And you can see the horrific image on the right hand side of a, of a whale being flensed. This is at South Georgia. This is an area that we go to now. And this is in the day where, you know, whales were harvested. You can see the redness spilling out of their guts. So these krill are really important to whales as many uh, other species as well in the Southern Ocean. So going into a bit of biology, which is my background. Um, this is what I love doing, um, describing how animals actually function. So you can see that a krill is divided into two parts. You have a cephalothorax at the front end. So that's where its eyes are, it's where its gills are. And you can see all those sort of antennae and, uh, and furry Thoracopods, uh, they're the feeding basket. So what the animal does is it scoops up its food, puts it into a little bolus and then puts it into its mouth. And at the back, you've got the sort of the engine of the animal, that's the swimming legs and the pleopods. And they are quite dynamic animals. And actually those six articulating segments there can really provide an enormous thrust. Well, krill are just one of amongst uh, a number of species called the euphorsids. And I just want to get this point across that even though people talk about krill, they just think it's, it's one thing on its own. Actually, there's a continuum of them throughout the world. And they are sort of quite uniform in shape and size. Um, they go from about one to about seven centimeters long. And they have quite a regular body structure as well. And the eyes are either round or they have some sort of bilobe structure. And the other interesting thing is that they are actually found all around the world. So we even have krill on the doorstep of the UK. They're not the Antarctic krill, but they are something called Northern krill. But Antarctic krill are quite limited in their distribution. They're very widespread in the Antarctic, but they never go beyond the Antarctic. So what you got here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, this line going across here is called the polar front. 
and that limits what we consider to be the, the polar southern ocean from the rest of the world. And it's quite a strong front. It does limit a lot of organisms from going from above it to below it. So Antarctica are limited to that distribution. But within that zone, they actually dominate the pelagic community. And this type of organism isn't dominant anywhere else in the world. It just seems to thrive in the Antarctic only. And that's a big question for us about why does it do so well there and not well anywhere else? It's just a bit part play in all these other communities. So that's fascinating and still unanswered. So just to go a little bit more into the biology. So here are the pleopods, the swimming legs, and they give such a thrust that these animals can actually swim against the Antarctic circumpolar current, the strongest current in the world. They actually are strong enough to resist that current and swim in the direction that they want to. So it is quite a dynamic organism. They're also found in massive swarms. This is a swarm here pictured. You can see for scale, I know it's a very grainy image, but these little white things here, these are uh, fin whales trying to feed on this swarm. And this is just an average size swarm. You can get swarms that can be over 2 million tons. They're larger than Greater London in area. So they can be massive aggregations, the largest animal aggregations that we know. They also have other interesting features that are bioluminescent all over their bodies. They've got things called photophores, and these have functions that we're not certain about, but some of their proposed functions are that they break up the silhouette. They can almost be an alarm bell. If they're being attacked, it sort of tells all the other individuals in the swarm that it's being attacked because it's flashing its phosphorescence. Uh, and also, it can actually be a way of communicating, and we're not quite sure about that, but that could be very important, for instance, for finding a mate in the darker depths that it goes to. And they also have these other really interesting features, which I'll come back to later on in the talk, is that they do molt continuously. Now, if you think about crabs, crabs will molt on a seasonal basis um, when they're about to reproduce or at the end of a, a growth period. But these animals, they seem to molt every two, uh, one to two weeks. And we're not quite certain why they do that. It could be actually they want to get rid of all these external parasites because they have to swim so much that anything that's hanging off them will really slow them down and cause them a a lot of energy to try and overcome that. So we know that they molt regularly. And the other thing they do is they have these massive ovaries. This ovary we've dissected out of a curl here is over 40% of its body weight. It contains over 16,000 oocytes. And it might amass this two or three times a year and actually spawn all these eggs. So they're prolific spawners, which could be behind its great success. They also have a really interesting life cycle. So what they do is that once these eggs are spawned, they sink down to about 1,000 to 2,000 meters down as an egg. And then once they hatch, they have to swim back to the surface again. And it takes them about 14 days to go all the way back to the surface. And all they've got to rely on is the yolk that the female has given them. And given that they've got 16,000 of these eggs, trying to get enough yolk into each one of these eggs must be a formidable feat for a female quill to do. And so once it's got back to the surface after three weeks, that's when it starts feeding and actually has to get there uh, and actually survive that whole period. And I think, we think it has to do this in order to get away from hungry predators in the surface and even cannibalism. If you think they're in big swarms, all these krill are just filter feeding all the time. They'd just be eating their own eggs. So they have to get out of the way and then go through the early part of their life cycle before they come back to the surface again. Okay, so who wants them? Well, we know there are a linchpin of the food web of the Southern Ocean. So all these organisms, albatrosses, seals, huge colonies of penguins and whales all rely on krill. So it's at the basis of the whole food chain. And you think about actually how important they are. There must have been a massive surplus, so people supposed, when whales were made almost extinct with whaling in the earlier part of the century. But actually that didn't really happen. We still don't understand that. Everything seems to rely on krill in the Southern Ocean like it's not relied on anywhere else. And this is actually illustrated here in this schematic food web. So you can see right at the base of the food web is the phytoplankton that's fixing the carbon. And then krill are feeding directly on phytoplankton, and then that's going straight up to seals and whales. It's a very direct and short food chain, which makes it really efficient. So that means that a lot of energy is going straight up to these massive organisms, which makes them proliferate so well in the Southern Ocean. So this directness of the food chain is what makes it so productive and why you get so much of this charismatic megafauna, all these things that we see on television actually prospering in the Southern Oceans because of this direct food web that the krill are facilitating. 
But they are not the only customers of krill. They are a commercial target as well. There is a krill fishery and there are various products. You can see on the right hand side, there's a fish farm. A lot of this krill is harvested to actually then feed to animals that are in farms in fjords, either in South America or even taken to the Northern Hemisphere. Norwegians are really big on harvesting krill. They even actually are consumed in human products. Uh, the Japanese in particular like Antarctic krill. I think the Russians had a go at making them into paste and sausages. I've never tried one. I don't think I do because actually they are really, really rich. And I think you keep tasting them for days afterwards if you really do want to have a, a krill sandwich. But this is where the value is coming out of krill now is this new wave of, pro, of, of um, nutraceuticals they're called basically. They're looking for the health products that they can get out of krill. So krill is in a really pristine environment very far away from any industrialized nations. And so you're getting it from a source of a really pristine place where you can get things like omega-3 fatty acids, which are supposed to be good for our joints and for our general health. And they can mark up a huge price for these things. They also have chitosan, which goes into shampoos. They've even been used in fertilizers as well. Chitosan has even been used as a, a, a fat block. So rather than being a low quality product that goes into just feeding other fish, now they can make a lot of money from krill for these like high value products like uh, nutraceuticals. Okay, so let's go into the science of how many are there. So this is where the actual, when it all started, the biological oceanographer, this is like the holy grail for me. This is where biological oceanography really started. It was the discovery investigations. So these were investigations that were started to actually Initially, they were funded by the British Colonial Office to find out more about the food of whales. So they set off to the Southern Ocean and they started to chart well, the biology and the physics of the Southern Ocean back then. And they did this sort of an unprecedented scale of sampling that we would never be able to achieve in the modern funding era. They just went around the whole of the Southern Ocean and just did net sampling all the time. And you can see that their gear is pretty primitive very old types of nets there and just sort of hanging off the side. I don't think health and safety would be very happy with that nowadays, but nobody seemed to die back then. They knew what they were doing. And, and they got a fantastic data set that we were able to use in modern day, using modern day analytical techniques to work out where krill are and how abundant they are. And we've supplemented that since with our own attempts at trying to put more sophisticated nets in. It's still net technology. It still has the disadvantages of being quite labor intensive as I've sort of tried to doing a little list on the side of the advantages and disadvantages of nets. But we still do this a lot to try and work out where these organisms are. But what we also supplement that with these days is actually making acoustic, bioacoustic surveys. We do very rapid, non-invasive surveys of large areas and we use the bouncing of sound of these small particles to work out where they are, how many there are through very careful calibrations that we make. And we've done these surveys throughout large areas of the Southern Ocean now. And so through combining the net information and the acoustic information, this is what we've come up with. It's a distribution and abundance of Antarctic krill. So I want you to get two things out of this. Firstly, is to actually see that this area here is actually where most krill are. So it's not equally distributed around the Southern Ocean. There's an asymmetry that seems to be focused around. This is the island of South Georgia. There's the Falkland Islands, Malvinas there, and there's South America. This is where all the krill seem to be. And if you can see this white line I've tried to plot on there, that's where the major fishery is. So you can see that this co not coincidental, they're actually where the boats are trying to fish the krill are, is actually where most of the krill are. The other thing I wanted to get out with this is actually the number that I've got here, which is 150 million tons of krill in the Southern Ocean. And that's actually equivalent to the total biomass of the human population. So if you put us on one side of the scale, and all the krill on the other, we just about balance out. But you can think of how many krill there are for every individual human. There are millions and millions, trillions of these krill in the Southern Ocean. So it's the largest biomass of any wild animal species as far as our estimates are concerned. So it does incredibly well in the Southern Ocean. Sorry, I've skipped over that one. So this is actually, that's probably not even the final total because there are habitats that we haven't been able to get into. This is something called ISIS. It's uh, an autonomous uh, ROV. Uh, and what happens is that it goes to very, very deep parts of the ocean that we can't see through. So putting nets down because it would take too long or using acoustics, which are mostly limited to the top 300 meters. And we actually put these down to 3000 meters and we saw krill on the actually bottom of the ocean there 
quite amazing they can actually go to those lengths. They're probably feeding on all this phytoplankton that's fallen to the bottom of the ocean, which is still good, nutritious food for them. Another habitat that we have difficulty getting into is under the ice. There's lots of ice shelves. There's a seasonal sea ice that expands and contracts. We can't get under there with our boats. You know, it takes a long time. And so what we're doing now is they'll be putting these types of drones in. They're called auto subs. And they have various instruments on them, like acoustics. And this actually is acoustics that we found about 10 kilometers into the ice. So we weren't able to get there by boat, but we put this in there. And we saw there was large aggregations of krill underneath this ice, probably feeding on algae that actually is on the bottom side of the ice. So that's really interesting. That's going to add to our estimate of the total biomass of krill. And in fact, this is my first nod to one of the UWC alumni that's come across my path. This is Damien Guian who was actually at Pearson College in year 27. He actually works with these autosubs. He started off with us, and now he's in the University of Tasmania, where he's flying these things uh, both around Tasmania and taking them to the Antarctic as well. And he's trying to sort of find out these new habitats for krill, as well as other organisms, as well as measuring the physics and the chemistry of the oceans at the same time. Okay, so why do they matter? Oh, I'm sorry, this is a really complicated graph, but what I want to focus on just a few things on here, basically, is these red lines. So this is basically the flux of carbon going up into the atmosphere and where it comes down again. But these red lines are actually what put on, we put on to actually find what the actual contribution of humans are to this carbon cycle. So the unit is petagrams of carbon. And what we have coming up into the atmosphere through our fossil fuel burning is about 7.8 and then also land usage by burning and things like that, adds up to around 10 petagrams of carbon that's going up into the atmosphere. Now, four of those actually stay in the atmosphere, and that's what's causing the increase in CO2. But you can see the rest of it is coming back into the land or the ocean. So about a quarter of all this has been emitted is going back into forests, into phytoplankton, into, um, sorry, not phytoplankton, into trees, into grasses, and back into soil. And so it's been taken out of the system that way. But the other quarter, is going into the ocean through the photosynthesis that's happening on the surface of the ocean by phytoplankton. So they fix the carbon from the carbon dioxide in the surface of the ocean. And then what happens next is really important because one, one um, uh, scenario is that it just comes straight back out again and goes back into the atmosphere. But the other scenario is that it sinks into the deep ocean. And you can see this red number here, that's the inventory of the amount of carbon that's in the interior of the ocean. So a much bigger number than these fluxes that you can see here. And the difficulty we have actually is accounting for all that carbon. When we actually piece this together with mathematical models and our understanding of how these fluxes happen, we can't actually account for the amount of carbon that seems to be getting into the deep ocean. And it doesn't get into the deep ocean everywhere. Certain parts of the ocean are more important than others. And the Southern Ocean is really, really critical a lot of this carbon has been taken in in the Southern Ocean, a disproportionate amount, about 40%. So actually what we don't know is actually how the carbon gets into the deep ocean as efficiently as it does. And so that's been a key part of the research that we've been doing, is trying to chart what happens to this carbon as it goes into the deep sea. And this is where the other alumni comes into it. So Anna Belcher, if you said at the start, if you noticed, I was in Belcher House when I was in Atlantic College, so basically, Anna is the daughter of my housemaster when I was in Atlantic College. She was actually born as I was leaving Atlantic College, so, so it puts me, puts my own age into perspective, but there we are. She's now a postdoc working in my team, and she's actually focusing on this transport of carbon into the ocean deep. And you can tell by the clue here, she's looking at the, the actual role of krill in this. So what she works with is something called a, a snow catcher which doesn't catch snow. Snow is basically a term that we use for all the marine particles that seem to be just hanging around and slowly sinking uh, in the ocean. So she puts this thing in the ocean. She captures water at various depths. She brings this snow catcher back onto the ship and then just lets these particles sink through the body of the snow catcher and then harvest them at the bottom to see what they are. She does this in the, sort of the upper part of the ocean, as we would call it, so between naught and 500 meters or so. And what she found in her publication uh, that I'm talking about here is quite a lot of these particles that she was finding in the ocean that were sinking really fast and taking a lot of carbon 
into this deep ocean, this unknown source of carbon, possibly is coming from krill fecal pellets. So these are the digested things that are coming out of krill the other side once they've eaten all the phytoplankton. The other thing we do is actually then see what happens next. So Anna goes to about this depth. What I'm showing here is a oceanographic buoy. So this is actually in about 3000 meters of water. These railway wheels are on the bottom. This is the release that we would let go so we can just get it back again. And you can see these yellow things here, these are sediment traps. So one's at 500 meters, you can see the other one's 2000 meters down. And what these sediment traps would do is they capture this raining snow as it comes through the ocean. So this is the carbon sinking down through the ocean and trying to categorize what that carbon is. So in this particular study, we actually found again that krill fecal pellets dominated the amount of sinking carbon. And they actually dominated in a way that shows that the flux was really, really fast. This type of process isn't being captured in the models that we have so far about where the carbon goes. So this is a new process that people didn't really realize even 10 years ago. So what we have, this is our working model at the moment, is what we call a krill flux. That you have krill that are actually feeding on the phytoplankton, they're uh, ingesting it, they're digesting what they can, and then they're ingesting these fecal pellets. And these fecal pellets are coming up because they're in swarms. You get masses and masses of these fecal pellets that are swamping anything that might be feeding on them. These copepods here are what we call detritivores. They would feed on the raining uh, amounts of marine snow. They just get completely overwhelmed, so they can't actually harvest enough. And so a lot of this fast sinking fecal pellets get driven right into the ocean interior and taken out of the system. So mitigating for those carbon dioxide emissions that we are making. So it's a really important process. And we estimated over 35% of all atmospheric carbon sequestered in the Southern Ocean is actually done by Antarctic krill. And actually the area that it happens most, this is actually a picture of the marginal ice zone. So this actually to the north of here would be open sea and to the south, that would be the pack ice that we couldn't go into. And all this is the seasonal ice, the thing that expands and contracts every summer to winter, this marginal ice zone. This is where krill love to inhabit this interface between where the ice is and where the open ocean is because there's rich in nutrients, lots of phytoplankton there. So this is where all the action is happening. These are really important areas, hotspots you could call them, of carbon drawdown and sequestration, taking it into the deep ocean and out of the way. And in fact, we actually, as well as the academic publication, we did something called Frontiers for Young Minds, which actually came out last week. And what they do is that they actually put it into language for, say, 14, 15 year olds who actually review the paper as well and tell you what they think about it. And you sometimes have to re-edit it to make sure that it makes sense. And then you get a lovely cartoon made by an illustrator. And what they've done here is that they made the krill into the Olympic champion of pooing. And uh, I couldn't agree more because they do a very fantastic job. Okay, so what is their future? So krill is allowed to be harvested. It's, it's not an area where there's many things you can't do in the Antarctic as part of the Antarctic Treaty, but you can harvest marine resources. So we have a body called the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. And its remit is to minimize the risk of change to Antarctic marine ecosystems through the regulation, not the stopping of harvesting. It has a very uh, international approach to this. It has conventions that it goes by, it meets every year to see what's going on the, in the Antarctic and then sets limits to what types of things can be harvested and in what ways. So its principles are, so any harvesting should be conducted in accordance with the following principles of conservation. Firstly, the prevention of the decrease in size of any harvested population to levels below uh, which uh, they will not be stable. And then the maintenance of ecological relationships. So the things that are feeding on them as well must be maintained. So that actually there's a strong and uh, an unperturbed relationship between the thing that's being harvested and the thing that relies on them, such as the whales, the seals, the penguins, and the albatrosses. This is a history of actually the catching of krill in the Southern Ocean. It started in the 70s. There was a big peak in the mid 80s, and this was from the Russian fleet. The Russians are really into catching krill for various resources uh, and that continued and so it peaked at around 600,000 tons and then as we go into the 90s you can see it fell away again and actually coincided with the 
the breakdown of the Soviet bloc. They couldn't afford to subsidize these fisheries. They weren't making any money at all. And so it collapsed. And basically what came in here with the Japanese and the Norwegian has gradually increased since. But you can see this curve is now going upwards and Kamlar is starting to become a little bit more worried about how much harvesting is actually occurring. The other thing I've got in here, which is not in relevant detail, is the areas. They give me quite obtuse names like 48 and 58 and 88. What I want you to focus on is that this area 48, this is the area that we know most of the krill are and where the fishery is based. And as you can see, most of the fishing has actually occurred in area 48. This is a really poor graph, I apologize for it, but <clears throat> I'll try and talk you through it. In the 70s, you can see the harvesting is occurring quite uh, far around the Southern Ocean, actually mostly in what we call the Eastern part of the Southern Ocean. But then you can see it's starting to focus more and more around the Antarctic Peninsula area. And when you get to 2010s, you can see actually it's really tightly focused on the Antarctic Peninsula, hardly anywhere else. So that all the fishery fleets are now concentrating in a very small area in order to get their quotas. And there's a new wave of exploitation. The technology of harvesting krill has increased dramatically over the past decade. You have this Norwegian fleet now operated by a firm called Aker, And what they operate is something called suction harvesting. So they put this net in the water and they just pull it behind the boat continuously for days, even weeks. And all the time it's sucking the water from the cod ends onto the ship where it gets processed. It's a very efficient way of harvesting krill. It means that the krill are really fresh when they're brought up as well. And if you want to get these high quality products out of them, these nutraceuticals, and actually trying to get krill as fresh as you possibly can is really important because they degrade really quickly. One of the other worrying things that's happening is actually there's a new Chinese fleet being amassed as well. So it's augmenting the size of this fleet that are trying to exploit krill. And Kamlar have got a very close eye on that. The Chinese are cooperative as all nations are in trying to make this harvesting sustainable, but you can see the pressure on giving quotas out is increasing. But you can, uh, the actual role of Kamnar is to make sure that the harvesting that does take place is precautionary. What I mean by that is that this is the, this, the Atlantic sector where all the krill are. This is an estimate of its total biomass as we saw earlier. This is the catch limit according to the yield model. So you can sort of have a sustainable yield model that tells you how much you can take out of this catch without affecting the biomass the next year, because it'll recruit and, and keep going. And this is now a trigger level. So this number, 620,000 tons, is the same number as the maximum yield that's ever been taken out of the fishery uh, in historical times by the Russians. So they know that when this amount was taken out, Nothing was really going wrong in the amount of krill in the water or the things that were depending on the krill. So at the moment, this is the total amount that's really allowed to be taken out of uh, the population of krill. And you can see that's a really small amount compared to the total population. So in some ways, you consider this to be a sustainable way. As long as they can monitor and enforce this, then it should be a sustainable way of harvesting the fishery. But that's not completely the end of the story. So Greenpeace have got their eye on this. And what they're pointing out is actually that the fishing effort is getting closer and closer to areas that are, say, in close proximity to biodiversity hotspots, particularly, say, penguin colonies or whale feeding grounds. And they published a report on this in 2018 called License to Krill, and actually are pointing this uh, out, and it really spooked the krill fishery. Camelot worked sort of to one side of this, but the krill fishery felt as if they were being persecuted to some extent. And the whole thing about having a a health food product is that people want to buy it because they think it's sustainable. If they think that this fishery is not sustainable, their market will collapse overnight. So they responded with an announcement. Actually, I've got the BBC News announcement of this, is that they're going to establish buffer zones around the breeding colonies of penguins. And so actually they're going to stay away from what they consider to be these biodiversity hotspots for Greenpeace. Now the problem with this to and froing is that it's not completely based on science. And the scientists weren't really consulted on this toing and froing of what is almost like a public relations exercise about where they can actually take the krill or not. And I'll just show you a schematic here explaining what's going wrong with this interaction. So just to orientate you on this graph, on the right hand side is the inshore stocks. This is on like the shallow water getting close to the continent itself around the Antarctic Peninsula. And here's the offshore area going into the deep sea. And here's the shelf break. So in the life cycle of krill, what normally happens is that the adult population will get further and further away from where these colonies are 
and go further off shell to go into this spawning cycle. And if you remember, they go into the spawning cycle where the eggs have to sink really deeply and then come back up again. So they have to get off the shelf because if it happened on the shelf, they would never get to the depths they would need to get to and they would die. So the adults are making a spawning migration, we call it, to the off shelf area. Now, the problem is by responding to the Greenpeace accusation, all the fishery is now being pushed off shelf. So the fishery is now operating in the area where the key spawning grounds are actually occurring. And so that's going to be devastating for recruitment for krill into future years. So even though they might be protecting seals and penguins in the short term, the actual population sizes of krill are going to diminish because they're actually fishing out all those spawning females that are responsible for the next generation. So we've tried to redress this. We've just written a scientific paper now. I won't go into the title there, but you can see it's a multinational a set of authors there trying to point this out to the fishery and say, well, actually, whoa, stop, stop doing all this PR stuff because actually you're endangering the future of krill. So it's important that science is always consulted when you're talking about fisheries management. So it's not just the biology, but also the management of this area that's really important that involves the science as well. And this is one of the key roles that my team and myself are trying to play in this whole ecosystem management approach that they're taking. So just, just to end on a not so bright note, actually, I'm sorry about this, but actually what's also happening to krill is that their populations are in decline. You can see this graph here. It's taken from some of that historical data from that discovery investigations going back to the 20s and then going into sort of more modern day. That graph has shown a decline in the biomass of krill over recent decades. And that's coincided with two things that are happening around the Antarctic Peninsula. There's a warming of the oceans and atmosphere, and there's also a decline in the duration of ice. Now the ice is really important to actually produce those productive environments that krill need. And there's also a good nursery for these overwintering stages of krill. They need to be under ice in order to, to succeed over winter. So there's a dual problem for them. And you can see this graph is just showing where these major spawning areas are on the shelf edges to the off shelf. And this is where the duration of ice is actually decreasing the most. So that's actually, in fact, that's actually affecting the recruitment potential of these organisms. And the other thing that's happening is there's a retreat polewards. As things get warmer, uh, species normally go to the temperature that they would prefer. So as these temperatures get more and more polewards, you find that quite often species will follow them. And that's definitely happening with krill. But going back to the times of the 1920s, 1930s, a lot of the population of krill was much further away from the continent of Antarctica. But as things have warmed up, this paper is showing that actually krill is getting more and more concentrated further south, going into areas very close to the continent. And there's basically running out of space now. They can't go any further south because there's a nice shelf there, there's land there, they can't get into any colder waters. So as things warm, it's going to become unsustainable for krill. And this is just a schematic showing this, that actually in the last century, krill was throughout this entire, we're looking from the Antarctic Peninsula out towards South Georgia. Krill was all the way out there and now when you look in modern day, South Georgia is getting greener. Uh, the ice is coming back. It's not there for as long. And the krill are getting closer and closer into the Antarctic continent. OK, so to summarize, so we know it's a biomass rich resource, but we know that exploit and exploitation is also increasing with the new markets and the high value products you can get out of krill. Krill plays a really vital role in taking carbon out of the atmosphere, anthropogenic carbon that we're putting in there krill are one of the key players in trying to get that out again and making it safe in the deep ocean. At the moment, it's a very well-managed resource to some extent, but actually there are things going wrong with certain PR exercises and trying to locate the fishery in areas that might not be so important uh, to penguins and seals, but are really important to krill. And actually, it really requires careful management. But as things are changing in the Antarctic, so the distribution of krill is changing, and they're getting closer and closer to the Antarctic continent itself, potentially running out of space. So from being one of the most biomass rich wild animal species on Earth, uh, the future of krill possibly is bleak uh, and things need to stop changing in order for them to succeed as they have done historically. Okay, I'll leave you with this image from Bill and Will, the Happy Feet Krill. So there's a quote directly from the film is, Bill the krill says, I fear the worst, Will. And then Will the krill says, I fear the worst too but only because fearing the best is an absolute waste of time. And there is an image of the Pooh Olympics, which we love actually, that's our favorite image at the moment, Krill, the pooing champions of the world. 
Okay, that's the end of my lecture. So I'll stop sharing now. I will bring this back up if you have specific questions on some of the graphs I've shown. But I think that's, uh, that's what I have to say. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Geraint, for this fascinating talk. Uh, it's amazing how such a small organism ha can have uh, yeah, such huge impact on, on us and our lives and livelihoods. Um, from my point of view, it's, it was also wonderful to see uh, the uh, UWC alumni projects and engagement that you've had uh, over over the years in your in your different work with uh, people who've graduated from different UWCs. Uh, uh, we welcome your comments or questions for for the from the audience uh, via the chat. Uh, we will begin um, uh, with a question from uh, Sheila Fletcher. Sheila, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question directly? Sure. Um the first question you've answered about the retreating ice sheet and the problems um, that's brought, but could you explain a bit more about this magnificent um, locking of carbon into the deep ocean? And it, that's doing us all a huge favor, but what would reverse that? If you could explain a bit more, I don't really understand about how it's locked down there. Yeah, so what happens is that there's something called the thermohaline circulation. So none of these bodies of water stay completely static. They are moving around the ocean very slowly at depth, in fact. So what happens when the, the, the carbon gets into a really deep part of the ocean is that it moves slowly away from the Antarctic back into the world's oceans and eventually will diffuse back up into other areas, tropical areas. But that process is so slow that it might take 100 or a couple of hundred years before that carbon gets released back into the atmosphere again. In fact, some of this body, the real deep waters take almost a thousand years to get back to the surface again. So once the carbon's in there, it just doesn't diffuse back again. It's going against gradients that would stop it from coming back into the atmosphere. And when it eventually does, you know, that's well beyond many, many people's generations of lifetime. So that's making it safe, uh, at least for the short term uh, to medium term. Um, th does that answer your question about how slow these processes are in the deep? Well, it, it's good news for us, but um, we're depending on the krill to do that job for us. Yes, and I mean, the, it's, it's sort of academically, it's quite interesting because uh, we were not able to work out how all the carbon got down there. That was the big academic problem. But, you know, in terms of like human civilization, it's actually quite a a good news story in some ways that there are animals out there doing a really important job in terms of taking carbon out of the system. It's Thank not you. an ultimate solution, you know, they can only go <laughs> as fast as they can, but you know, they're doing quite a lot more than we originally thought. Um, thank you. The next question we've had was from Robbie McDonald. Robbie, would you like to ask your question? Hi, Geraint. Thanks for a, a Hi. super talk. Hi. Uh, um, I actually hadn't appreciated how important drill uh, poo production was in the sink in, in the Southern Ocean. And I just, it struck me that there's a kind of theoretical question that if, if human protein requirements were, were more met by eating krill compared to eating terrestrial mammals, so if we, you know, if we moved our protein requirement from cows and pigs and sheep and so on, ungulates, into eating marine um, krill, would, we, would that actually achieve a net benefit? Or because of the importance of krill, would we see a, a, a worsening, do you think? Um, I think the answer to that is how you harvest it. You know, I, I think that there are really crucial areas where you have to leave krill alone. And I was pointing out to those spawning areas where you know, if you don't allow krill to go through their natural life cycles uh, in those areas, the, the, the wider population will not succeed. But there are areas that are almost dead end areas, such as South Georgia, where they don't successfully recruit, but they have huge amounts of biomass there. They're eventually just going to die, rot down or be eaten. And in those areas, actually, you can harvest quite a lot without having an impact on the population and the recruitment. And in terms of actually the efficiency of it, well, it actually is a primary uh, consumer of, of phytoplankton. So it's uh, the equivalent of cows or sheep, I suppose, but a really efficient one in that it doesn't have to build up the, the massive resources of body tissue that those animals do. And so it would be quite an efficient way of actually consuming protein if it was palatable. And that's the second problem is that it's not very palatable at all. And um, the other problem with krill is that they have lots and lots of fluoride 
in their exoskeletons. And so it's actually poisonous if you eat too much of it. And so there's, there's quite a delicate sort of chemical balance of trying to get the good things out of it uh, without actually bringing all the toxins. Uh, you know, fluoride is not dangerous in very small quantities, but if you overdose on fluoride, it's, it's very, very bad. So um, yeah, th there are problems with using krill as a major biomass protein source. Which is why we feed them to fish, basically, because uh, fish will do all that processing for us and then we eat the fish. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Stan from uh, AC75, I think you have a question as well. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, Gary. It's a fabulous talk. Um, a bit of an obvious, uh, simple question. I'm curious about your daily life routine as working for the British Antarctic Survey. How much time do you spend on site? Uh, what's, it, what's it like? Bloody cold, obviously. Yeah, well, um, if I start from the present and then go backwards. So at the moment, I'm in my office, which is a real luxury for me. Um, I have to come in, actually, because I'm training somebody to go to the Antarctic. So this year, we've got a really difficult year, as you can imagine. We have to minimise the number of people we send to the Antarctic because we don't want to introduce COVID to the Antarctic. It's not there yet. And if it does get there, it's a real problem because we can't get people out again very quickly. And so if people are suffering down there, you know, it's a real critical problem. Um, so this year is exceptional. I have to come in and train people, a minimum number of people to go south. Uh, and we normally send people down for about two months and they stay on a ship to do oceanography and they go around and do transects, um, which take about four or five weeks at sea. Um, and then uh, the rest of the time we are spending in the lab processing the samples that we actually get or analyzing the, the, the data from remote sensing or from those acoustics that I talked about. Um, so in an average year, I would maybe go to the Antarctic um, for about four or five weeks. And then if it's a very busy year, I have to go to the Arctic as well, because we're, a, I don't know a better phrase for it, we're a bipolar organization. So we actually work in the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, and actually our Arctic work is increasing now because you know, the skills that we have and we have to apply in the Southern Ocean are the same as in the Arctic. The Arctic is a much more crowded playing field. There are a lot of very interested nations who are trying to exploit the Arctic. It's not protected like the Antarctic. So there's a lot of commercial exploitation up there, which we didn't have to worry about in the, in the Southern Ocean. But it's also an important area for this carbon drawdown that I talked about. And those are the things that we're working on up there. So in terms of time away, I would spend maybe two, possibly three months away and the rest of the time in the lab and, uh, and with my family. who are very happy mostly to have me back. Thank you. Uh, one of our attendees, Bernd Ewald, asks for a small clarification, um, if you don't mind, uh, Geraint. He, ju he, he just wanted to know, uh, did you say whether the proportion of the available krill in the Antarctic being fished as of now is tiny? He just wanted to... Yes, I, I, I can answer that directly. It is small to the total population of krill. So the 150 million tonnes uh, is there. Theoretically, uh, the harvest rate at the moment is about 400,000 tons. It, the problem is where it's being harvested, uh, because there are certain areas which are really important for recruitment. So even though krill is widely distributed, it only recruits in very small areas. And so what we're trying to avoid is actually harvesting krill from those areas of crucial recruitment. So that, that's the main message I was trying to get across there. So as a total overall biomass is tiny but it's the actual where it's being harvested that really matters. Thank you very much for clarifying. We have a question from Tony Curley from AC19. Tony, would you like to ask your question directly? <clears throat> Hi, yeah. yeah. Um, first of all, great talk. It put all the bio lectures I've sat through in the past month to shame. Um, really enjoyed it. Um, I was wondering how, I don't know if I missed it or if you said it, uh, but how people get involved with the BAS and what sort of sciences it covers, if it's just like biology or? Yeah, I mean, uh, the British Antarctic Survey is, is it's not, in terms of people, it's not massive. I mean, it has about four, 500 people in total of which about uh, 200 are scientists. The rest are people who actually deal with uh, logistics and operations in the Southern Ocean and on the Antarctic bases that we have. We have two Antarctic bases. Um, in terms of the scientists, it's quite diverse, actually. We, we're multidisciplinary, so we have a team of biologists. Um, some are working on ecosystems like me. Others are working on benthic biology and also coastal systems. 
And then we have uh, physicists who work on the oceanography, the physical oceanography. Uh, as you can imagine, we have people working on the ice, glacial ice, and also the sea ice, and atmospherics as well, because uh, actually the British Antarctic Survey uh, with the organization that actually found the ozone hole uh, and actually brought all that into public consciousness and we were spearheading the, the measures that were taken to actually reverse that process and explaining what it was and making sure politicians were arguing for the right things. And that's been a success story for the British Antarctic Survey, actually. Um, in terms of getting involved, um, I think that actually there are various opportunities in terms of doing a postgraduate programs. We get involved with a lot of universities. There's a thing called doctoral training partnerships that we get involved with, so, and also master students. We don't actually award degrees ourselves. We're not an academic institute in that way. I mean, we have academics but they actually are working for the British government ultimately. They're not working for universities, but what we do is collaborate with universities and then bring students into the organization that way. Um, the other way of getting involved is like being um, a field assistant. They do have openings for those. I would say there's a caveat there that quite often the field assistants who get the jobs are the ones who've actually done some experience, uh, you know, either being sort of ornithologists or, or sort of mountaineers in the UK first. They normally send people who are, are relatively experienced because you imagine that the stakes are quite high in Antarctica. Um, and there's also, you know, there's public relations and things like that. But public relations are really important to the British Antarctic Survey and they do a really good job of actually advertising the science that we're trying to do uh, and making sure the message gets out there. It's a really successful science organization in that way. So there's multifaceted ways to get involved um, but it is a relatively small organization, I would say that, on the other hand, as well. So, you know, it, it's, it does, it's not a massive employer, can I say that? Thank you. We've got a question from Juliet Caesar. Juliet, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, I, I think I put my question in the chat, but I was just asking if you see any evidence of the um, krill in the Antarctic adapting to the warmer waters or whether you're learning things from the other krill populations in different parts of the of the world maybe yeah that's a lovely question i've, I've just brought out a paper on that actually so uh yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so they they can adapt to some extent because they do go across at least some gradients of temperature uh, and so you get this sort of short-term adaptation where they can actually um, alter their metabolic rates to suit the temperatures that they're in um, but there is an, an upper limit where they can't go beyond because if they go beyond that for the respiration in particular, they become anaerobic and that's only a short term measure. So, you know, they can sort of hold out for maybe a few days, but then they just can't keep up with the anaerobic respiration and they tend to sort of keel over. So there's a short term acclimation is what we would call it. That is possible for them. But as a long term measure, what we find is actually the great limitation for them is not the actual adults being able to cope with warmer temperatures. It's the recruitment of the, the juveniles and the larvae. And that seems to be very constrained. Uh, it could be constrained by temperature. It could also be constrained by the availability of sea ice and also food. And those sorts of conditions only sort of coalesce in very small areas of the Antarctic where it's perfect for them. And so our worry is that those conditions are becoming less and less available. So it's not a physiological adaptation. It's actually being in the right place at the right time for krill uh, for that early part of their life cycle. And if they're not, then that's when you see bad levels of recruitment. So uh, it's yes and no, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. And um, thank you very much. And uh, to conclude, as we only have uh, time for just one more question, I think we have a really a good segue in the form of a question from Thornsten. Thorsten. Would you like to ask your question directly, Thorsten? Yeah, hi, uh, this is Thorsten. Hi, Geraint, a long time since we shared a dorm in Belcher House. Yes. I have to say, you, you look the same as 33 years ago. So, oh, wow, you're uh, too fantastic. kind, Torsten. So it's too bad yourself. My <laughs> so my question is this. Um, I've, I've become a bit disenchanted with Greenpeace, I have to say, because oftentimes they're more interested in PR than in the actual science uh, behind it. And um, I noticed also that the title of their paper was a lot catchier than the title of your paper. And I was just wondering if it if it had any if your paper had any effect um, in that did the fishing practices change or are they still catering to Greenpeace telling them to stay offshore? 
a really good question, actually, because um, <clears throat> that PR stunt that happened from the fishery itself was in direct response to what Greenpeace were, were actually saying, which was, I would say, unscientific, what they were actually going on about. Um, but the, the, the fishery management organizations could not afford for that bad publicity to keep to sort of take hold in, in the public perception. So even though the fishery management organization, CAMLA, that organization told them it's fine, just keep doing what you're doing, just voluntarily by themselves, the fishery organizations decided to move off shelf. Um, and so even though um, that happens almost voluntarily, what they didn't realize was the implications of that in terms of the, the biology of krill itself. So, I mean, the, the problem with Greenpeace is that they do some really good things. So one, one of the good things that they've done in the Southern Ocean is alert public perception of marine protected areas. So these are areas around say islands or, or hotspots of activity where nothing is allowed to happen at all, not even harvesting. And they've been really good at actually pointing out where these areas should be. And then they've gone to organizations like Kamlar and done it through the correct channels and actually argued why there should be marine protected areas on scientific grounds. And then they've been uh, actually put into place and, uh, and that's actually helped a lot of biodiversity and also whale recovery as well. But then they go off piste as it were, and then they do other things like these publicity stunts like that article that I just showed you. And then that really perturbs everything and then management sort of starts to have to catch up with that because things have happened so fast and haven't been scientifically regulated that it has implications that are unforeseen. So it's, it's a bit of a, a blunt instrument, Greenpeace, I think sometimes. And, and the more science we can put into it, the better, but sometimes they don't listen because they can just see a PR opportunity. And so, so they didn't also recognize your paper and change, change their request uh, after that? Well, they do look at papers, but sometimes, you know, they don't really go into the detail of papers and, uh, mm. and, and not really fully okay. understand the whole situation. They just sort of see it from a superficial point of view don't get too engrossed with the actual details of the science and then come up with some, because they've got, you know, an enormous international reach. So anything they say, people take seriously, you know, and, and some of it is, is, is good, but not all of it. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Geraint, for this fantastic talk. Uh, I, uh, we all really enjoyed it. And thank you for uh, answering all of the questions. Um, Thank you to our attendees for joining us today. Uh, our Atlantic Circling Conversation series is held mostly bi-weekly on Thursdays at this time of the day. We hope that you will be able to join us in the future and we would be delighted if you wanted to share your feedback on today's event with us. My colleague Carista has posted the link to uh, the feedback form and we'll also be circulating this form uh, to you uh, by email. So we welcome your uh, comments. Thank you once again, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Geraint, for your fantastic talk. It was an absolute pleasure. Lovely talking to you all. <laughs>